Hi, I'm Julie Hornock with United in Autism, and I am a parent of a child with autism. I also wrote the book, United in Autism, and Temple Grandin wrote the foreword. And the book is 30 stories of families living with autism. And I believe storytelling is so, so important. And so each week I'm gonna interview either an expert or a parent of a child with autism and hear their advice, have them share their stories, and hear how they're okay even in the midst of autism. So I cannot wait to share with you who I have today. Take a look. Hey everyone, I am so excited about who I have for you today. Okay, so as parents, we have dreams for our kids. We want them to be employed. We want them to get married. We want them to have kids. We want them to have a family. We want them to have a life. We want them to be passionate and be giving back to the world. And Ron Sanderson has done all of those things and I'm bringing him here. We're going to talk with him about how he's been so successful living with autism. Hey, Ron. Hi there. Thanks so much for having me on your podcast. Well, thank you for your time. Um, let me just tell you a little bit more about Ron. He works full time in the medical field and is a professor of theology. He's an advisory board member of the Autism Society Faith Initiative of Autism Society of American. He is a master of divinity. He's an author of The Parent's Guide to Autism, Practical Advice, Biblical Wisdom. He has memorized over 10,000 scriptures, including 22 complete books of the New Testament of the Bible and over 5,000 quotes. So I think it's safe to say you have been extremely successful, not only by standards of a person with autism, but by the world's standards for any person. And I, I'm just so impressed with what you've accomplished. Oh, thanks so much. I just have like some more questions I'd love to ask. I mean, so do you remember when you were a kid? Cause I've read about you and heard stories and do you remember, what do you remember first thinking, okay, I might be a little different than other people. One of my first memories of autism was when I was, five years old and my parents took me to see a, a Maxwell Smart movie and Maxwell Smart for the younger listeners is the voice of Inspector Gadget. Oh. At the beginning of the, the beginning of the movie there was this glove and it kept getting bigger and bigger and then it exploded and when the glove exploded I exploded and was running around the movie theater my mom was trying to catch me jumping up and down seats popcorn flying everywhere took her about 15 minutes to get me out of the movie theater and I still wouldn't calm down and my mom had to take me all the way home and then once the movie was over pick up my brother Steve Chuck and my dad from the movie theater and at that age of five I knew something was different I remember too at age six knowing there was something different about me when I went to a birthday party by myself for the first time and I had a cowboy hat and I was spinning it around on the laces on the cowboy hat and it was annoying the other kid but I kept doing it and being entranced by that cowboy hat and nobody mm -hmm. wanted to be around me because they were afraid of getting hit by that cowboy hat and those were some of the two um, most prominent memories real early on of autism making me different and also not being able to communicate as a young child and express my feelings and I remember I used to bite the head off Star Wars figures when I was three years old. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's amazing that you have those very specific memories. And I know even for some of our nonverbal kiddos, they must be realizing, okay, something's different. I, I'm not the same as everyone else. And so how did you learn you had autism? The way I learned I had autism is my mom sat me down and said, you learn differently than other kids. And that's why you have difficulty pronouncing different words. Also, she needed to let me know about the different areas where not just educational, my disability affected me, but also with um, digestive system and um, health issues. When mm -hmm. I was very young, we went on a vacation out west. And if I didn't eat every four or five hours, I'd pass out and wow. black out. And mm -hmm. that's how we learned that the autism not only affected my ability to communicate and my ability to social interact, but also my health issues. And when I became a star track and cross country runner, beginning in sixth grade, starting to get involved in sports, that hypoasthemia and the blackouts went away. So wow. exercise had a real impact on my digestive ability, 
and also my health issues. And my mom told me the different areas that my disabilities affected me and then worked with me in those areas to compensate or be able to find ways to live healthy, well-being on the spectrum, which really helped a lot with being able to go to college, be able to have a wife and get married and have a family. All wow. Those areas. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's interesting that you say about exercise. I've always felt that way, but it's really nice to hear from you. And uh, do you still exercise a lot? Yeah, what I do now is I got that little Jack Russell Terrier mixed with Pomeranian. I put him on his leash and he goes running and I go running after him <laughs> on the leash. And he keeps me, me and him will do a two mile run. And mm -hmm. what it does too is it helps me stay, lose the weight, excess of weight that I put on over the years. And it helps the little Pomeranian Jack Russell, Rudy, to um, be able to lose some of his energy that he's a high energy, strong animal. So yeah. when he comes back, he's just more um, willing to just sit down instead of bark or um, wine or do his other little things. So it works both ways. Yeah, well, that's a win-win for sure. Um, so you talk about honey badger moments where you, that's what you call when you were younger, you used to have these big meltdowns, which I think every parent of a child with autism is familiar with the meltdowns. I love that you gave them a name. So can you just shed a little light on this for us? Like what is causing these honey badger moments for you when you were younger? It's when your world is being torn apart and feels like it's being destroyed. My last honey badger moment happened um, four years ago, and it was when my wife was pregnant with Michaela. My parents said they were going to turn my man cave in my parents' house, which was my old bedroom, into a nursery. And mm -hmm. in my parents, in my bedroom at my parents' house, I have over four thousand books. I have over a six thousand dollar calico critter collection, and over a thousand animals from around the world that I've collected over the years going to different countries. And it felt like my whole world was going to be destroyed. And I had a meltdown. Needless to say, their guest room became the nursery, not my <laughs> bed, bedroom or man cave. So you cannot stop a meltdown. You can help realize the things that are going to cause a meltdown and try mm -hmm. and prevent them. The most vivid meltdown I ever had was when I was in third grade and I was in Cub Scouts and I went to a Cub Scouts meeting and they had a scary clown and the clown knew nothing about autism and thought it'd be funny to take the hat off my head, put it on oh. the other kid's head and put it back on mine. And he had a lamb puppet that he used to commit the crime. And when he took the hat off my head, put it on his head, when he was putting it back, I grabbed that lamb puppet with one swing and proceeded to beat the snot out of the clown oh, in front no. of over 250 people. Uh -oh. I ran out of there and never became a Cub Scout or made it to the woods <laughs> by flew like an eagle and got kicked out of Cub Scouts. And they told my parents never to come back if I couldn't control my oh. temper like that. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I mean, there's such a difference. I've noticed it's just a lack, like my, my daughter, when it used to happen a lot, she just can't control it. It's not thought through. It's not. So what, say there's a parent out there and their child just has begun to melt down. They didn't foresee it. They didn't, they weren't able to kind of help it not happen. So they're in the middle of it. I mean, what is the best thing to do as a parent to help your kid get through it easier? Cause I know they're hurting. I know they're suffering, yeah. you know, the best thing is, is a remove the crowd. If there's mm -hmm. people around say, you know, my child has autism, he's having a meltdown. It's a complete loss of ability to control himself. It's not a tantrum. They can't control him. It's not or something they want. It's their whole world is being destroyed and mm -hmm. they just need some space. And then also after the meltdown, to brief the child, find out what was the antecedent, what caused it, and then mm -hmm. what was the aftermath? How do you feel now? And how do we think in the future we can prevent this ha from happening and with if you're a person who works with a kid with autism or a teacher there's different signs some kids will start tapping their hand against their head before they have a meltdown and for others that's just stemming so asking the parents what are the signs are the best some kids with autism if they start getting hyper or start getting those feelings that they're going to have a meltdown something as simple as turning on water can soothe them or putting on their headphones and listening to a song that soothes them. So knowing the different things that are calming for a child can help. 
with me, I work in a high stressful environment. I work as a psychiatric care specialist at Havenwick Hospital. And there's times where it's high stress. One of the things I do to keep my emotions and sensory issues and processes, I have over 100 Bible verses on note cards, all new ones that I'm currently memorizing. And I go over those while I'm doing rounds and it helps my mind stay level and stay focused mm -hmm. and be able to um, stay calm no matter what the situation. There's a word called diptych, which means being able to adjust to any culture, any environment at any time in any way. And mm -hmm. I always say that's the best way to keep a meltdown from happening is to be able to learn to adjust to that environment that there are situations that still can call a meltdown and even typical people can have a meltdown but we call them a total um breakdown usually mm -hmm. and it lasts longer with a typical person if they have a breakdown than a meltdown because with a meltdown they're more frequent with kids with autism than a, a total breakdown which some typical person may have in a tragic situation of a death mm -hmm. of a loved one a loss of a job or some other major life um, altering situation. Yeah. Okay. Well, so you're saying like your mom kind of debriefing you afterwards or someone debriefing you afterwards. Is that what you feel like helped you to now be able to control this yourself? Cause you're, I mean, you're doing this yourself now, which is amazing. Yeah. I think too exposure. You have that TV show called exposure. So people are afraid of snakes and they mm -hmm. put them in snakes. And, um, there's a great book out there right now called Autism Uncensored. And okay. I, I'm interviewing the author for an article in The Art of Autism. But what she did with her child is she used exposure to help him overcome meltdowns. He was okay. terrified of airplanes. By the fifth airplane ride, he didn't mm -hmm. have a meltdown. And wow. I think my mom did the same thing. She had me out and about in society and out and about even if I had a meltdown. We moved on from there. We kept moving, going ahead. They got me involved in activities like Boy Scouts. When I got kicked out of Boy Scouts, I yeah. was in the Indian Guides. They had me in karate. So mm -hmm. they always had me actively involved in some kind of event. Or And even with um, employment, my dad had me out mowing our lawn at age 10. It was an mm -hmm. acre lawn, even though wow. it made me have meltdowns once in a while he just kept at it and made me get my first job by age 14 i worked in god's waiting room which was bill knapp's restaurant based on its ancient clientele of the people going to the restaurant it got that nickname so they That's always funny. had me actively involved in um things that typical kids did and they never allowed autism to be an excuse for me not to be involved mm -hmm. and even with intense speech therapy. I was in intense speech therapy all the way from age two to age 16. So they always use the resources that were there. They always had me involved and then they used their own resources too. They paid for me at private tutoring, which helped out a lot. And all those different things got me to a place where I am today, being able to control my temper, being able to work in a full-time job 40 hours a week and also wow. speak at 70 events a year and also I've written over the last four years over 100 published articles and two nationally published books and working on third one where I'm already 50% through the book. That's, that's fantastic. I mean, it's like you're on it, you're doing it, you're living it, and it's just so incredibly wonderful to see. Um, if you could pick, I know you talk very highly of your mom, which many people with autism that I talk with have the same thing where they just like their mom is their person. And I love that of course, cause I am a mom. Um, but tell me like one thing that your mom would do that just really helped you. Like if you could pick a thing. The main thing she did was she worked with art with me. When I'd write my name, I had not only autism, but I had dysgraphia, bad handwriting and dyslexia. So every time I'd write my name, it'd be backwards, but she knew that I had great spatial ability for memory and great art ability. So at age five, she'd have me draw pictures of squirrels, pictures of koalas and other animals. And then she'd have me tell her a story. She'd write down the story and then she'd have me rewrite the story from her handwriting. And within two years of her doing that, I went from dyslexia to no dyslexia. I still have bad handwriting, but with computers today, I can type everything, which mm -hmm. helps out a lot. And that was one of the main things she did. She also 
use my special interest. So she used my special interest to get into my world so I could get into her world. And what she oh. did is she'd um, write me letters from Cheddar to Squirrel, and each one would have a different life skill to learn. And oh. She'd mail them in the mail, and there'd be different pictures of postcards with squirrels, and they were all of Cheddar's friends, and she'd come up with names for them. She'd even have oh. friends write them so that writing was different from different squirrels, and they'd teach me life skills, and that really helped me out. She also, they had Safari cards when I was a kid, she'd order those and then use those to help me learn how to read. Because if you're interested in something with autism, nothing gets in your way of learning the information on there. Whether it's reading, whether it's writing, whether it's comprehension, you're going to be able to remember those things and be able to process it and learn mm -hmm. to generalize things through your special interests where the generalization may not be there in other areas you're not interested in. So she always took an interest in what I was interested in. And before B ABA therapy existed, she used ABA therapy in the sense of rewards and reinforcements mm -hmm. by buying little toys that, um, of animals, plastic animals. And if I went a day without having a meltdown, I'd get one of these little plastic animals. And if I went a month without any major incident, then I'd get some toy that I was interested in. Usually they were animal toys and and as i mentioned earlier i have over a thousand of these types of animal toys and things from around the world that are animals in my man cave in my parents house and even on my wedding cake we had calico critters of the european um <laughs> the prince wedding so it was a cat bride and groom and a oh, favorite, man. um priest doing the wedding that was on our cake i and love your so wife good. for letting you do that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so you let me do it. And they actually, it ended up being one of the best wedding cakes that they ever made, the the, um, the place at um, the bakery. And they actually took a picture of it to use in future um, show in their books for different cakes you could get. Wow. I mean, that's, that's incredible. I love how you said she used your interest and pulled in the skills within your interest so that you would generalize it. Because that's, I haven't thought of it in that way that it'll be generalized if it's having to do with your particular interest because of that yeah. interest. So these skills wouldn't otherwise be generalized, but they are. Um, that's very interesting and helpful. Uh, your mom sounds amazing. So I'm so thankful that you have her. And um, I know all the moms watching now, it's like, this is just what we want to do for our kids. We want them to be saying the things you're saying one day. So um, thanks for sharing that. And all right. Another so great example. Oh, sorry. Was say, no, you go ahead. great example is, Right now, everyone's posting the articles about Eric Weber, the attorney from California, passed the bar exam. He's a lawyer now who mm -hmm. has autism. Yes. And I've interviewed him before. And one of the things I noticed about him is his mom, again, is a great advocate. He's a great advocate for autism. But when you ask him just general question, he usually had monotone. But he has a special savant ability like I do with Bible verses, only it's where he can quote um, vast amounts of famous comedians. So like Kevin Hart and um, yeah. all these other ones. But when he quotes the comedians, every time there's inflection in his voice. And really? there's another famous um, young lady, Hale, who, uh, Haley Moss, who has autism. She's also a lawyer. And when you talk to her, she always had great inflection and no monotone. And where most of young adults I interview would autism have the monotone. I said, how come? There's no monotone. It's you have the inflection like you should. She said when I talk about things I'm passionate about, the inflection's there, and that's how kind of came up with. I've noticed too in the areas where we're able to generalize, our passion is related to it, so we're able to do things like a typical person in those areas. Yeah, that is that's so interesting. Yeah, I I'm I'm thankful you shared that. I would have had no idea. And I have noticed that some people have, I mean, your inflection is really good, I think. And some people are flatter and, you know, um, and I'm, I've heard them talk about how their people give their words intention that they don't have if it's flat, you know, and yeah. so they work on that inflection just so they can control their own meaning, which I think is really impressive too. It's that extra step. But um, so tell me just, Give me, well, let me talk about your book for a second. Um, it's called A Parent's Guide to Autism, Practical Advice, Biblical Wisdom. And I'll put a link to it down below the interview. But 
just share with us just a few important things um, when parenting a child with autism. You've shared so much already, but maybe give us a few more things you talk about maybe in your book. Yeah, so number one is the most important thing is focus on ability rather than disability. People mm -hmm. on the autism spectrum have these great abilities, and those you can make stronger, but they also have disabilities that are valleys compared to mountains. In those areas where the disability are, you may never be able to make them stronger like you can with other disabilities. But if you make those abilities stronger, they can compensate for the disability. And that's one of the things I look at is how to develop those talents, those gifts, and refine them. Also, I look at social skills. How can you help a kid with autism be able to better socialize? They say that in the job market now, one of the main things they're looking for is people are able to interact and have those skills. And without being able to communicate, you could have the greatest mind in the world, but if you're unable to communicate, you can't succeed. One of the young adults whose stories I share in my book, he got a perfect score on the SAT, perfect score on the ACT, but he wasn't able to, to pass his classes when he went to an Ivy League school called Duke because he didn't know how to ask for directions to get to the classes. Oh my so goodness. If you have the best mind, you don't make it to class, you're not going to be able to succeed. And my book teaches how to develop those talents, develop those gifts. And also a lot of kids with autism lack self-confidence. So I have a whole chapter on building your child with autism self-esteem. And I interviewed Miss Montana 2012 Alexis Weinman mm -hmm. doing that chapter in her family and share her story because she oh, demonstrates I, that ability. I know everyone will be so excited to read about that. So we'll share that story for your book just so that I can get it and read about it because that sounds super interesting. Yeah, um, yeah I, I lo all three of those things are fantastic. And um, thank you for sharing that. I think that will be really helpful. That self-confidence is such a big piece for any child, just making sure they're confident as they walk out and that'll bring more opportunities. And that's really, really great. Um, okay. So you're highly successful working in the medical field, also a professor, have just a fantastic memory. You got, you are married, you have a child, you have many animals in your home. What a rabbit, a dog and a cat. Is that what you said? Yeah. And they all chase after each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what did your, obviously you're super sick. Oh, and also you're able to control your own meltdowns and really regulate yourself, which is such a, beautiful skill to have on your own. And so kind of tell me what, how did your parents prepare you for when you were leaving the house and what did they prepare you to, just to be on your own? So here's one of the things my dad did. It was really awesome. I desired to go to Oral Roberts university to get my degree in theology and then go on to get my master's degree. But I had a horrible fear of leaving the house. So what he did is he got in the airplane with me during college weekend flew 950 miles away from Rochester Hills, which is a 16-hour drive. Mm -hmm. And he showed me around the university during college weekend. He got um, me set up there. He introduced me to different professors in my field of theology and also the general classes. And he also introduced me to who would be the RA, residential advisors and those. Mm -hmm. And then when it became time for me to go to R. Roberts University, he again boarded in a plane with me, flew 950 miles back to Tulsa, got my schedule set up, went with me to get my schedule set up, and everyone else was by them, themselves or with other students doing that, and he was right there. And then he mm -hmm. took me around to find where the mailbox was, where my classes were, where the um, student um, help area was if I needed extra help in my classes, and then... Um, had me all set up for success so I knew where everything was and mm -hmm. that really helped me out with being able to leave the nest yeah gave you the confidence right to it gave me confidence too, know where everything was so I wasn't as scared going away and one of the good things he did too is that he didn't allow me to go to Oral Roberts University my first year but he made me take a scholarship at Rochester College so I was at home my first year of college and adjusting to college and looking back, that was the best decision he could ever know. So there's got to be a balance of letting go with your children, but also mm -hmm. holding leases till you know they're ready for the next mm -hmm. step. 
and then yeah. making baby steps to get there. And that's what my parents were really good at. They were really good at getting those little steps to get to the bigger picture and um, fulfilling it. My mom, every um, month, would send me money to take out a nice ORU girl. Oh, that's so too. cute. That's so sweet. I love uh, how supportive your parents are, and it really did pay off. So um, that's fantastic advice. That prep is so important. I do that with my daughter on everything. Um, we prep and get prepared. Right now, we are taking tiny, tiny baby steps, learning to drive. And did you do you drive? Yeah, I've been driving since I was 16. I like to joke, there's no atheist in a foxhole, and there's no atheist when you're child with autism is learning to drive. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. So but did again, it take, they, go ahead. They um, took baby steps to help me learn mm -hmm. how to drive. They had me take driver's ed and then mm -hmm. my dad would take me out to empty parking lots and areas where no one was around and then go over how to drive. And also the importance of um, looking both ways and also not doing left turns where there's a lot of traffic. And even this day, I am not a, ticket or an accident wow. over 10 years, but I'm a very cautious driver. And I'm, in the United States, 34,000 people die every year on the highway. Mm -hmm. So knowing statistically keeps me driving safer. Wow, that's, that's great. I love that you got your facts down too. So well, we have so much enjoyed having you. I mean, I feel like I have so many takeaways from this. I know every parent that watches this will just have so much more knowledge and how to help their kids. I just, I want to thank you again. Um, tell everybody where we can find you online. You can find me at spectruminclusion.com. That's my website. And then my two nationally published books is A Parent's Guide to Autism, Practical Advice, Biblical Wisdom, which is in Barnes & Nobles and on Amazon, and Thought Choice Action, Decision Making that Releases the Power of the Holy Spirit. That you can get on Amazon, or you can go to Barnes & Noble website. You can get it there. And all my books are also on my website. And I'm currently over 50% through with my next book, which is autism, which is on autism, Autism Express, Pairing Adventures of Faith, Hope, and Love, which I hope to have done by next year. Okay, so we'll take a look at your website. Oh, tell us about Art and Autism, because that's pretty incredible. Tell us about your involvement with Art and Autism. So I was on a nationally documented film that the producers from Austin, Texas, Dr. Lawrence A. Becker, and it features me and seven others, well-known savants and prodigies with autism, whose parents use art to develop and build gifts in their lives and help them gain independence. And I got to May 13th, be out in Austin for the world premiere of the film. Ron Zimmerman, the main um, filmer for America's Most Wanted for over 25 years, did all the filming. Wow. And then... Um, Dr. Dreffitt from um, Wisconsin, who was a main person they consulted for the Rain Man movies, was mm -hmm. um, did the background talking and commentary for the movie. So it was wow. a, really cool. So now you use that platform then, because I've noticed, you know, on Facebook, it's a pretty nice sized group, and you use that just to showcase different people with autism and their gifts? Or Yeah, and in my new book I'm writing, Autism Express, um, one of the main things I do is I interview 20 remarkable children on the autism spectrum and their families and share their stories, like a pro baseball player, a NASCAR driver, mm -hmm. a hockey player, and um, show how those parents took those talents, refined them, and were able to teach them social skills, help them gain independence, and be able to um, be productive in life. Mm, that's that's fantastic well thank you so much again i've loved talking with you hopefully maybe we'll do it again sometime because i feel like you have yeah, so much more that. to get <laughs> yeah all right you have a great fantastic evening all right you too thanks so much thank you Bye. i hope you enjoyed what you heard today i hope you got some great tips and i hope you feel maybe a little bit less alone if you'd like to see more interviews like this you can check me out on all the socials and the handle is at United in Autism. Also check out YouTube for videos and I hope we see you again next week. Thanks so much.